Florida, the Sunshine State, lies on a large peninsula surrounded by the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Florida Straits. Miami, the city of razzle and dazzle, is probably the trendiest holiday destination, not only in Florida, but in the entire U.S. There's a long list of film stars and rock musicians here, doing their best to attract the attention of fans and the press in Miami's elite bars and clubs. The city has long enjoyed a reputation of being the playground of the rich and famous. You can have a great view of Miami from the unique Metro Mover, which is a minibus that runs on a track. The Bayside Marketplace is a real beach shopping haven with over 150 stores, restaurants, and a lot of street musicians who give real live jazz and reggae concerts. Behind is the city's downtown, the place where the first skyscraper was built in 1924. This is the business and government center of Miami, with government agencies, banks, corporate offices, and the bastions of the local media. Miami was incorporated as a city after the railway opened the way to the development of tourism. Soon after that, the seaport was built and became a marine traffic hub for the United States, the Caribbean, and South America. The seaport at Biscayne Bay is a departure port for cruises to the Bahamas and the Caribbean islands. The harbor is also frequent host to the largest cruise ships in the world, such as the Queen Mary II, the Liberty of the Seas, and the currently largest passenger ship, the Freedom of the Seas, with its gross tonnage of 160,000 tons. It's 340 meters long and can accommodate 3,600 passengers. You can't imagine the size of such a ship until you've seen one from the outside, and you can't imagine the level of luxury it provides passengers until you've seen it inside. Miami is also the departure port for cruise ships, with a destination in the nearby Palm, Star, and Hibiscus Islands. This is where Al Capone, the infamous gangster of the Prohibition era, also once lived. Today, it's home to the residences of American celebrities who've worked hard for their fame and fortune in show business, such as Madonna, Sylvester Stallone, Sean Penn, Prince, or Gloria Estefan. Of course, the seaport and the waterways surrounding it aren't only used by cruise ships. Florida is a paradise for owners of private yachts and rowboats, and lovers of surfing and jet ski. Motorboats, sailing boats, and rowboats dock in front of the waterfront villas. At sunset, life in Miami livens up. Hundreds of nightclubs, intimate taverns, jazz bars, and trendy dance clubs are there to choose from. As proof of the city's great versatility, this is where the country's fastest growing cultural community, including the Metro Date Performing Arts Center, the Bass Museum, the Miami City Ballet, and the Florida Philharmonic can be found, offering music, dance, theater, cultural, and artistic performances all year. The Convention Center, the Exhibition Center of Miami Beach, is host to important international fairs and exhibitions. The white sand beaches of Miami Beach are lined by a road of palm trees with the most famous hotels on it. The top choice of movie stars, rock legends, and top models is South Beach. There are four causeways leading into the elongated and narrow peninsula. Collins Avenue runs along the eastern side of the peninsula. It's basically a shopping street, but it also boasts a plethora of architectural masterpieces. The Impala, the Cavalier, and the Carlisle are only a few of the impressive hotels here. Other well-known shopping streets are Lincoln Road, Española Way, Washington Avenue, and Ocean Drive. The number of sharks living in the waters of Florida is relatively high, although they rarely attack humans. Partly as a precaution, and partly because of less skilled swimmers, a lifeguard service was introduced on the beaches. 
The lifeguards, well known from the television series Baywatch that took place in California, safeguard beachgoers on all American beaches. They save at least 500 lives every year working as volunteers for free. You can rent various watercraft, surfboards, and jet skis at the beach. Generally, here you can find everything you would expect from such a legendary beach, including the endless sunshine. All the districts of Miami have their own distinctive style. Coconut Grove features Renaissance buildings, spectacular festivals, and a busy nightlife. Its most famous street is Brickell Avenue, which is home to private villas, millionaires' residences, and luxury boutiques. The most famous of them is the Villa Vizcaya, built by the industrial tycoon James Deering at the time of World War I. If you like sightseeing, make sure you visit the Art District of South Beach, where you can admire 800 impressive buildings. You may not see this many special cars anywhere else in the world. Due to the great weather, many enjoy the view of the city, passing by in convertibles. The Lowe's and Royal Palms hotels are the newest jewels of Collins Avenue. They're truly sensational from an architectural point of view. You can see for yourself if you look up the 3D models of these buildings on the internet. The most popular beach of Miami Beach is located in the southeastern corner of the peninsula next to the world-famous Ocean Drive. If you think you'll only encounter nicely tanned athletic youngsters on the beaches of Florida, you're wrong. In the beginning of the 20th century, Tens of thousands of retirees came here from the northern and midwest regions of the U.S. and from Canada because they realized how good the pleasant local weather with the mild winters is for their old bones. Later, the relatively low real estate prices and favorable mortgage rates have attracted a lot of pensioners from northern and western Europe as well. Those who spend only a week or two here can envy them for their prolonged vacation. Can you imagine anything better than having the huge blue ocean at your feet and the Art Deco villas considered the symbols of luxury and elegance behind you? In one section of Ocean Drive, between 6th and 15th streets, quite uniquely in the world, you can still find traces of the favorite style of the 1920s. The white or candy-colored pink, green, and blue houses embellished by square and curved plaster stuccos with their unique rails and typical low but wide windows. You'll find a bed and breakfast, a restaurant, or a terrace cafe in most of these houses. Art Deco is a French expression used to describe an architectural and industrial design style that also had a significant effect on painting, sculpture, and film. The movement began in France and conquered the whole world. It was the most popular in the U.S., but played a significant role in Europe as well. Its origins can be traced back to French Art Nouveau, but it also incorporated and combined some typical features from other avant-garde styles. It took geometric stylization from constructivism, the praising of everything modern from futurism, and the painting basics from cubism. It was also strongly influenced by ancient Egyptian art after Howard Carter discovered Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. As opposed to the organic, wavy, and swerving patterns of Art Nouveau, Art Deco is characterized by straight lines and geometric designs, and in terms of that, it's similar to Bauhaus. 
The buildings of the Art Deco District of Miami Beach served as a setting for many famous and less known movies and television series. The structures have captured the imagination of not only filmmakers, but artists as well, since many painters live and work in this area. 1114 Ocean Drive is the address of Casa Casu Arena, the former home of the late Gianni Versace, at the gate of which the 51-year-old fashion mogul was killed. On July 17, 1997, Versace had just returned from his usual morning walk when he was shot. His killer, the deranged Andrew Cunanan, committed suicide shortly after the murder. Versace was one of the most versatile and talented fashion designers of the late 20th century. He was also the costume designer of the famous TV series, Miami Vice. His work was influenced by Andy Warhol, by ancient Roman and Greek art, and by modern abstract art. He opened his first boutique in Milan, and his company is still one of the top fashion houses in the world. They design and sell luxury clothing, accessories, perfumes, and furniture. The famous Everglades is located on the southern tip of the Florida Peninsula. This wetland is well known all over the world from the movies that were shot here. The Everglades is the largest subtropical wildlife area that has remained in the United States. The 567,000 hectare national park is divided into three sections that are open to visitors. The daily entry tickets allow access to all three areas. You'll find a visitor center at the entrance and a hotel in the park. It also offers one large and several smaller wildlife observation towers. Flamingos and other waterfowl live in large numbers in the Everglades. It also has very characteristic and beautiful vegetation. This huge wildlife park is home to about 30 Florida panthers. However, it takes great luck to catch a glimpse of even one of these gorgeous and shy predators. But you will see many of the alligators, now all so familiar from the movies. They operate on solar energy, which means that they have to warm their own cold blood up in the sun so they can move. It tends to get a little they often spend half a day completely still, but once they get moving, they're capable of amazing speed. And not all of them are as friendly as the detective's little friend he kept on a leash in Miami Vice. The largest males can reach a body length of five meters. American crocodiles differ from alligators in that their color is light and their nozzles are cone-shaped. It's an endangered species that can only be seen in this national park. If you wish to explore this unique landscape, you can do so by plane, in a canoe, by bicycle, or on foot. But the most popular way is undoubtedly to go around by airboats or swamp buggies. Yo -ho, yo -ho. The rivers originating from Lake Okeechobee flow very lazily towards the sea. Their waters are usually shallow. Mangroves and other trees set root on the tiny islands and reefs in the lagoons. The surface of the water is covered by water lilies. You can also see many butterflies, turtles, and otters here. The Mikosuke Indians have been living in this region for centuries. In their village, you can buy small handicraft articles as souvenirs, and you can watch a unique alligator fight as well. Key West is literally the last in the line. This is where those who want to get away from the rotten air of the cities and step into a happy and bohemian atmosphere come. There's no other place in the country where you'll find so many bars and churches. The Florida Keys are an archipelago consisting of 800 islands. The highway connects 42 islands, running 182 kilometers, assisted by 143 bridges. The famous Seven Mile Bridge is part of this system. It was featured in several films, for example, in the Schwarzenegger movie, True Lies. Despite Herculean efforts, 
There are several hundred islands that are accessible only by water, so the old air of the Keys still remains. You can spend your vacation lying in a hammock under the palm trees, listening to the faint sounds of reggae music from the distance, or you can go shopping or relax during the day and go partying to a nightclub or bar. Or you can even go fishing. It doesn't matter which one you opt for, you'll notice that life is never dull in Key West. Sunset isn't merely a time of day here, but an event. Hundreds of people gather on the beach to admire it. No wonder Ernest Hemingway also lived here for over 10 years with his many, many cats. There's a festival every July in his memory, which is one of the main cultural events of this area. 113 kilometers west of Key West are the Dry Tortugas, which can be accessed only by plane or boat. You can see some beautiful wonders of nature here in the form of corals, fish, and birds. This is the southernmost point of the country, with Havana only 137 kilometers away as the crow flies. So it's no wonder that crowds of Cuban immigrants attempt to cover this distance in their coracles. And many of them have succeeded. They live in Miami's little Havana or have settled down here, adding another color to the multicultural palette of the Keys. Between the homes of Hemingway and the great American playwright Tennessee Williams is where you'll find the Key West Lighthouse. After climbing the 98 steps to the top, you'll be rewarded with an unparalleled view. The adventurist Ernest Hemingway came from a well-to-do middle-class family and was born in a suburb of Chicago. His father was a nature-loving country doctor. They used to go hunting and camping together in the woods of Michigan or fish in the local lakes. His attraction to nature was the basis of his lifelong passion for outdoor adventures and his longing for faraway, isolated places. He began his writing career as a reporter for a newspaper called the Kansas City Star. He went to World War I as a volunteer. Built this home in 1851, <clears throat> lived in it until his death in 1889. Ironically, our wealthy Ty, coon up there, managed to die here alone and without a will, leaving the home in the honorings to state South Florida has ever had to clean up. The litigation over this place went on for decades. The house wound up being boarded up and set vacant until Ernest Hemingway bought it years later. Hemingway's first look at Key West would be 1928. He was passing through on his way home from a trip overseas. In the same year as the writer moved here with his second wife, Pauline Pfeiffer, his father, troubled by ill health and financial problems, shot himself in the head. When the U.S. entered World War II, Hemingway assisted the U.S. Navy in locating German submarines off the coast of Cuba. Later, he participated in the D-Day landings, where he was wounded again. He was the first to march into Paris as a leader of a partisan unit. In 1953, he received the Pulitzer Prize for his novella, The Old Man in the Sea. One year later, he also received the Nobel Prize in Literature. Hemingway's house in Key West is a museum today. This is where he wrote 70% of his books, in a garage that he had converted into a den. In 1940, as a result of his divorce, he lost his beloved Key West home. Soon after, he married Martha Gellhorn, a reporter he had worked with. Together, they moved to the Finca Villa Villa near Havana. In his last years, he lived in Idaho, receiving treatment for high blood pressure and manic depression. On July 2, 1961, he shot himself in the head. British actor and traveler Michael Palin has just published a book about the locations of Hemingway's life, devoting a significant section to Key West. There's a hidden cozy little beach in the protected bay behind the house that's a preferred practice ground for jet ski beginners. The braver ones leave the safety of the headland behind and venture out to ride the waves of the open sea. The motorboats are pulling water skiers and parasailers. Key West has long become a legend. 
The once impassable land is now flooded with visitors who long for a special, once-in-a-lifetime experience. You can find open minibuses all over town. Most of the tourists arrive by boat and rent a small car locally. If you're ready to shell out more for the great American spirit, you can rent a Harley Davidson and tour the islands by bike. The Sloppy Joe, just like the Floridita and La Bodoguita in Havana, was made famous by Hemingway. He knew exactly which bartender in which bar made which of his favorite cocktails the way he liked it best. There's no lack of pubs today either, and if you stay here long enough, you can find your favorite spot too. Cocktails are all the better because the rum and other spirits used to make them are brought from the Caribbean, while the excellent citrus fruits grow locally, and there's enough ice around as well. And it's as if the regulars all wanted to look like the famous author. The Key West Museum presents the rich history of the area. The old wooden cottage in the harbor has been preserved with its turret from where they can watch ship traffic. A once proud sailing boat docking at its base has become an exhibit, and there's some kind of memory of each and every ethnic group that has settled here. 300,000 Cubans fled to the United States after the 1959 Cuban Revolution. Most of them found their home in Miami, but they can be found in large number in the Keys where they live in peace with the native Seminole Indians, white Americans, and the descendants of runaway black slaves who settled down here after the American Civil War. Key West also has an aquarium where you can see the native marine life on the coral reefs. The famous Dolphin Research Center where the television series Flipper was shot is in the neighboring town of Marathon. From the boardwalk, tour boats and airplanes take off to the islands, which is the mecca of treasure hunters and divers. In 1550, the Visitacion, a gold-laden Spanish ship. In 1600, the treasure ship of Diego Rodriguez. In 1622, the La Margarita. And in 1733, the fleet of Rodrigo de Torres all sunk off these shores. The innumerable shipwrecks sunk around here attract professional and amateur divers like magnets. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, was established in 1958 and starting in 1961, events sped up. The Soviets were the first to send a human into space. His name was Yuri Gagarin. That was when John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the young president who was later assassinated, initiated the space race. He ordered NASA to send astronauts to the moon before the decade was over. That, as we all know, was achieved in 1969 when Neil Armstrong made that small step that became one giant leap for mankind. NASA launched its rockets from their space center in Cape Canaveral, bearing the name of Kennedy. And that's also the site of space shuttle launches today. Project Mercury was followed by Project Gemini, then by the Apollo program. Space research and the rocket programs consumed inconceivable amounts of money, so Congress kept the budget. The situation only improved after the first reusable space shuttle was launched in 1981. This program had its share of problems, however. We all still remember the two disasters that shocked the world, 
the tragedy of the Challenger in 1986, and of the Columbia in 2003, which, due to the evolution of technology, people could see on TV all over the world. At the Visitor Complex of Kennedy Space Center, you can learn about the activities of NASA and about the everyday terrestrial and extraterrestrial life of the astronauts. Make sure you also visit the Rocket Garden and the Launch Center, where you can take a look behind the scenes. A full-sized replica of a space shuttle is on display. In addition, you can see exciting films about space missions in an IMAX production. The northernmost city of this stretch of coast is Titusville, where you can have a great view of a space shuttle launch. The city also has a space museum. The nearby Merritt Island is shared by NASA and the National Wildlife Refuge. This park is the habitat of the largest number of protected animals in the whole country. The Astronaut Memorial honors the American astronauts who gave their life for space exploration. Their names are emblazoned on a granite slate that rotates following the movement of the sun. North of Cape Canaveral are Ormond Beach, Port Orange, and Daytona Beach. Daytona Beach was made famous by Henry Ford, Louis Chevrolet, and Harvey Firestone. When vacationing at an Ormond Beach hotel, they discovered that the 150 meter wide white beach was perfect for automobile races. Races have been held here since 1902, and this was also where new cars were tested, becoming the home of many land speed records. In 1935, an experimental car propelled by a jet engine reached a speed of 442 kilometers per hour. For an extra fee, and not exceeding the speed limit, private vehicles can still leave their tire marks in the sand, but the official races have been moved away. The Daytona International Speedway Racetrack is next to Ponce Inlet. Here you can see not only stock car, motorcycle and go-kart races, but vintage car races and exhibitions as well. There's an interactive sports center at the tracks where visitors can learn about the history and behind-the-scenes secrets of motorsports. The Ponce de Leon Inlet Lighthouse does not operate in its original function anymore. It's a museum and observation deck now, offering a good view of the racetrack and the sports complex around it. If you're not a fan of car racing, you can still enjoy the fabulous beach that stretches along 37 kilometers. Further up north along the coast, we arrive to the city of St. Augustine. St. Augustine, founded in 1565, is the oldest city in America that was established by Europeans. It awaits visitors with its old world charm, unique attractions, colorful restaurants, and shops. It's easy to see why it's one of the most popular spots in Florida. Walking in St. George Street, in the historically important district of St. Augustine, you feel as if you were going back in time. Over 35 antique shops and 20 art galleries are waiting to be explored. The statue of Juan Ponce de Leon stands in the Plaza de la Constitución. The Spanish conquistador was born a member of a noble family in 1460. He accompanied Columbus on his second voyage and later became the conqueror of Santo Domingo and the colonizer and governor of Puerto Rico. He was forced to relinquish his office to the son of Christopher Columbus in 1512. He launched an expedition north of Cuba after that. The goal of his quest was allegedly to find the Fountain of Youth. Instead, he discovered the Gulf Stream. On March 27, 1513, 
he and his crew sighted land and found it so verdant that they called it Florida. On April 2nd, they went ashore at a point south of St. Augustine. They searched the peninsula they first believed to be an island, then took possession of it and engaged in several skirmishes with the natives. On his next voyage, Leon ended up on the west coast of Florida to establish a permanent Spanish settlement, but was killed by Indians. The palace of Henry M. Flagler stands behind the statue of De Leon. The American Railroad Tycoon had the Florida East Coast Railway Network extended up to the southernmost point of the peninsula, thereby creating an opportunity for significant commercial and touristic development for the area. After the American Civil War, he founded the Standard Oil Company that had its own designated railway line. His idea was that if he transported passengers by rail, he could make St. Augustine a winter resort for the rich. To this end, he had the luxurious Ponce de Leon Hotel built on the square, bearing the same name. His statue proudly looks at the Arabesque Hotel and at his equally lavish private residence on both sides of the main square. The small Avil Street that crosses the main street named St. George Street is a street of local artists. Its little old hospital and pharmacy date back centuries and the public library was also established in the 18th century. The majority of the Skansen-like small houses functions as a shop or an eatery. The Tovar House, built in 1763, had a very erratic life. The former trading post saw a long line of owners and was a witness to the entire history of Florida. Although the oldest house of the town was built only in 1703, a building stood in its place as early as 1600, and you can still see the well that belonged to it in the garden. There are two museums adjoined to the oldest house. One of them presents the history of the city, and the other one deals with the characteristics of Spanish architecture. Another very interesting place is the oldest store museum, which is a combination of an old general store and several workshops. At the tobacco counter, cigars are still rolled by hand, for which the tobacco leaves are brought from Cuba. There's a gunsmith, a blacksmith, and a saddler shop, all preserved in their original condition. Across the street, a Franciscan monastery that was destroyed by the British stood for two centuries. Sebastian Oliveros was a sailor and merchant from Corsica. He settled down and built his colonial-style house at this place in 1798. There are shops operating in most of the old trading posts and stores still today. Between Avil Street and the fortress stands the Zero Milestone. This marked the start of the old Spanish trail running across Florida and is the reference point for calculating distances. The most stylish way to roam the history-infused streets of St. Augustine is by horse carriage. The Castillo de San Marcos is the oldest stone fortress in the USA. It was built between 1672 and 1756 as a defense against the British. Its layout is a perfect square with a bastion popping up at each corner. The width of its walls is three to five meters with cannons staring out the loopholes. Once a moat and a drawbridge protected it. In 1586, St. Augustine was attacked and burned by the British privateer, Sir Francis Drake. It was rebuilt by the Spanish, but 82 years later, another pirate, Captain John Davis, raided the town and killed 60 people. In 1702, it was again attacked by the British. Then in 1740, the British General Oglethorpe besieged it without success. Although neither of the attacks was successful, the town eventually fell into the hands of the British, although in a peaceful way, when Spain gave Florida to England in 1763. The United States got control of St. Augustine just when the Yellow Fever and the Seminole War broke out. The fortress had long ceased to function when there were still deserters locked up in its prison. 
The road forks toward the inside of the peninsula at Daytona Beach, where Orlando is located. Orlando was little more than a military post up until 1875. It was named after Private Orlando Reeves, who was shot and killed by an Indian arrow. Due to its excellent climate, the rapidly developing small town became a real American metropolis and also the golf and tennis center of Florida. It has 800 tennis courts and 130 golf courses, in addition to a number of museums and a very pleasant downtown area. If you like shopping, you can pursue your passion in Washington Street or at the Factory Outlet World, where you can spend your money at 160 discount stores. Still, everybody comes to Orlando for the attractions offered by Disney World and the other theme parks. However, it would be a mistake to miss this bizarre museum, the Believe It or Not. That means you'll find unbelievable and shocking curiosities here that provide you with several hours of good entertainment. Ripley's Wonders fill not only one building anymore. There are similar museums in California, New Jersey, South Carolina, Toronto, and in several other places, usually specializing in local curiosities. Wonderworks, next to Ripley's, is a very special place. It looks like a house that was overturned by an earthquake or a hurricane. It's home to more than 100 interactive exhibits on tornadoes, the Bermuda Triangle, and earthquakes, among others. The hurricane season lasts from August to October on the Florida coast and has caused the demise of many a ship. It's still not very likely that the weather has been responsible for all the disasters occurring in the Bermuda Triangle. The imaginary triangle that connects Bermuda with Florida and Puerto Rico is a place of unexplained incidents with a substantial literature. There's an exhibition presenting these mysterious events from a new perspective. Everyone visiting the center of Florida must go to Disney World. The world's largest theme park complex offers four theme parks, two water parks, six golf courses, two spa resorts, and 27 hotels in a 110 square kilometer area, not to mention the shopping malls, stores, entertainment, and sports facilities. Walt Disney World is best approached through Pleasure Island. You can opt for the monorail or for a ship of various styles. The place has over 52 million visitors every year, the majority of them spending several days or weeks at the hotels, since it's obvious that visiting even only the most important attractions takes several days. The original park bears the name Magic Kingdom, and is exactly the same as Disneyland in California, with Adventureland, Fantasyland, and Tomorrowland in it. The Main Street, Main Street USA, lined by charming old houses, is a constant venue of spectacular parades and musical stage shows. You can meet the characters created by Walt Disney in the procession, and you can have your picture taken with Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Pluto, or Goofy anytime. You can choose from a variety of transportation, a trolley, the old railroad, an omnibus, or a vintage car. Getting closer to Tomorrowland, you can switch to newer types of vehicles. The cable car, the monorail, and the rocket vehicle awaits. In the newest attraction of the park, in Disney's Animal Kingdom, you can experience the excitement of life in the wilderness, including scary encounters with living, extinct, or imaginary animals. The 
park is actually an attempt at combining a theme park with a zoo. The Asia section presents the exotic animals and rainforests of the southern part of the continent. Epcot Center is an educational and cultural attraction that challenges your imagination and senses. You can taste a freshly baked croissant in France, learn about the age of dinosaurs, and explore the human body, all in one day. And at Disney MGM Studios, you can take a look behind the scenes of the making of Disney characters and movies. At the end of Main Street, in the shadows of Cinderella Castle, it's Walt Disney himself, the person who built an empire on a mouse, greeting the visitors. The castle is a reenactment of the classic stories, just like Fantasyland, where the small ones can meet Peter Pan, Dumbo, and Snow White. At Mickey's Toontown Fair, the characters of the popular animations come to life. Adventureland is more for the boys, bringing to life the adventures of youth novels. You can roam the old Wild West and see the world of Mark Twain, where Tom Sawyer crosses the river on a raft, impressive paddle wheel steamboats float on the Great Mississippi, and Indian warriors with war paint fight with rugged cowboys on the riverbank. A little further away, you can experience the adventures of Treasure Island and the Robinson family, including a pirate attack and getting shipwrecked. There's also a spooky haunted mansion and a medieval castle with real jousting here. The majority of attractions are interactive, so you can not only watch, but also participate in the adventures. In the park, you'll see extras in costumes and stuntmen performing stunts along with amazingly lifelike robots, hologram shows, and hundreds of other tricks everywhere. You can ride down the wild mountain river in a raft, which of course ends with a big splash. And in the Rocky Mountains, you can get on a western train that will take you on a roller coaster ride over the hills and valleys. The Universal Studios are a must see for everyone who visits Orlando. So are the natural attractions, among which probably the best place to start your visit is SeaWorld, where dolphins, whales, and seals put on the show. Those looking for aquatic entertainment will find a lot of options to do so. Wet n Wild, Disney's Typhoon Lagoon, Blizzard Beach are all water parks where you can escape from the Florida heat. You can also go on water slides, so it's a lot of fun. The newest attraction is that the water of Disney's Blizzard Beach is mixed with snow. Tampa Bay lies in the northwest of the Florida Peninsula. Tampa is a true reflection of the cultures and influences that have made it the dynamic metropolis it is today. The simultaneous presence of historic villas and glittering skyscrapers is a natural thing in this rapidly developing city. Make sure you visit Eber Square, where Cuban tobacco makers present the goods of their ancestors. The eclectic art galleries, nightclubs, balconies with wrought iron rails, and cobblestone streets further increase the captivating Latino atmosphere of the city. The bridges over the bay can be opened to provide smooth crossing for the ships. The former house of Henry B. Plant is one of the most beautiful examples of Moorish architecture on the Western Hemisphere. While the development of the East Coast can be primarily attributed to Henry M. Flagler, on the West Coast, it was Plant who created the railroad network and developed the infrastructure of the area. The works of these two men aptly demonstrate what an important role the railway played in the flourishing of certain areas in the 19th century. The availability of cargo transportation brought on a boom in agriculture and industry, while passenger transportation boosted tourism. These also led to an upswing in the real estate and investment markets. 
Plant himself had a number of elegant Victorian houses built in Tampa. His gorgeous castle now belongs to Tampa University and operates partly as a museum. Its park is a pleasant spot in the city. St. Petersburg, named after the Russian city, is the other well-known settlement of Tampa Bay on the eastern side of the Pinellas Peninsula. It's most famous for being home to the second largest Dali collection in the world, which will soon be moved into a new building. In the course of his long life, Salvador Dali created over 1,500 paintings, a number of book illustrations, lithographs, theatrical costume designs, and dozens of sculptures. The museum complex named Placa Dali will be a work of art reflective of Dali's unique juxtaposition of classical and fantastic elements, says the director of the museum. The collection that consists of 2,140 artworks will be exhibited in a 7,000 square meter building on three floors. The frame of the structure is the box-shaped building nicknamed the Treasure Box, with an adjoining glass bubble named Enigma. If you're interested in the history of navigation, you can count on a number of unforgettable sites around St. Petersburg. In the Florida International Museum, objects retrieved from the Titanic are on display. Next to the St. Petersburg Pier docks the fabulous sailing ship that was built for the Marlon Brando movie entitled Mutiny on the Bounty. A few steps away, you can visit a Russian submarine that was made in 1960. Paddle wheel steamboats are a familiar feature for everyone who's ever read Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer or Life on the Mississippi, or has ever seen some classic westerns like Maverick or How the West Was Won. From St. Pete Beach, you can see the ornate building of the Plant Museum. Mile-long white beaches, fancy palm trees, and the turquoise waters of the Gulf of Mexico are enticing tourists to just lay back and immerse themselves in enjoying the sun and the sea. The New Harbor Bridge provides easy access to the Pinellas Peninsula. Along this 45-kilometer-long strip of coast, you can find quiet, hidden bays and trendy, crowded beaches alike. This is the place that has the most pleasant weather in the U.S., with a record of 768 consecutive sunny days. South of the Bay is Sarasota. Sarasota is considered the cultural capital of Florida. This commercial town became a haven for artists and musicians in a short time. The cultural performances offered in the city are in the same league as those of any other metropolis. In addition, Sarasota is home to several world-famous art centers and museums. A gorgeous Italian museum of Renaissance art, the John and Mabel Ringling Museum of Art, presents one of the largest collections of Baroque paintings and 17th century tapestry works. Another building called the Ringling Residence was built upon the designs of a Venice palace in the picturesque Sarasota Bay. On the first floor, in the circus museums, you can see pictures, costumes, accessories, and circus cars. You can see a fleet of special vintage cars at Belm's Cars. In front of the building, there's a stylish public sculpture. California artist Dustin Schuler works with used cars to create his unique pieces. His creations are becoming increasingly popular in the U.S., which is considered the home of the automotive industry. The Edison and Ford Winter Estates pay homage to the inventor and the automobile manufacturer who once lived here. Thomas Alva Edison was probably the most famous inventor in the world. His great-grandfather immigrated to America from Holland in 1727. His father was a farmer who also tried his hand at running a bed and breakfast. Thomas was the youngest of his seven children. Edison developed a business acumen early, 
since every cent counted for the not overly well-to-do family. He was constantly thinking up inventions already as a young boy. His first ideas were connected to the telegraph. Since a couple of his early inventions brought him acclaim and financial success, he set up his Menlo Park Laboratories near New York. The work schedule of the shop was strange. The owner and his close associates, the Swiss Kruse and the German Bergmann, sometimes worked 50 to 60 hours at one stretch if they got excited about some technical problem. It was not by accident that people of such work habits met, but because Edison only accepted people who had the same work style as he did. They were all driven by a strange passion, but most of all, their young boss. He was in a hurry to invent, create, or make something truly significant, which would be known all over America and reach even Port Huron, where his mother lived. This was what he wanted. He wanted his mother to witness his success, to see that he deserved the faith and trust she had put in him. Then, on a windy April day in 1871, he got a telegram from Port Huron saying that Nancy Edison had died, as written in the biographical book entitled The Wizard of Menlo Park. Henry Ford was an American businessman and the founder of the Ford Motor Company. His mass-produced Model T car revolutionized the automotive industry. The motor vehicle company that bears his name is still managed by his descendants up to this day. He was considered a very productive inventor. He held 161 U.S. patents in his name. As the owner of the Ford Motor Company, he belonged to the richest and most famous people in the world. He not only revolutionized automobile manufacturing, but also the transportation and the industry of the United States. Edison always lived next door to his laboratories because quite a few times he rushed over at night in his pajamas to work on a problem he wanted to solve. He moved his famous Menlo Park home to Orange, New Jersey, and not much later, encouraged both by his second wife and by his friend Henry Ford, he set up a winter retreat for himself in Fort Myers, Florida. The two of them were among the first residents to settle down in the area. The estate on McGregor Boulevard also had ample room for a botanic garden, which was a source of great joy to the inventor and his family, and by now has practically turned into a jungle. You can see some early Ford vehicles in the exhibition, along with some related innovations. Edison started working at the railways at the young age of 12. He sold newspapers and food. He himself wrote, edited, printed, and sold his newspapers on the trains. He spent the money he made from that on his experiments. He started perfecting the telegraph when he was a telegraph operator. In the laboratory he set up in 1876, he experimented on and developed over a thousand patents, which makes him the most prolific inventor in the world. He improved the transmission range of Bell's telephone with his carbon powder microphone. In 1878, he patented a mechanical device for recording and replaying sound, the cylinder phonograph, the ancestor of all record players and tape recorders. In 1879, he invented the incandescent light bulb, and three years later, he put the world's first electric power plant into operation in New York. He constructed a motion picture projector and perfected the nickel-iron alkaline battery. Among others, he worked with the famous Hungarian inventor Tivadar Puskás and Nikola Tesla, who became later his major rival. Edison also cooperated with George Eastman, a pioneer of photography and cinema, and founder of the Kodak Company, so he was an active contributor to the golden age of Hollywood, too. In 1929, he and Henry Ford jointly established the Edison Institute. The Edison and Ford Museums are open to visitors every day until 4 p.m. The entry ticket is valid for both. Naples was established by Deputy Confederate General John S. Williams and Walter N. Haldeman, 
the publisher of the Louisville Courier Journal shortly after the American Civil War. The little town gained ideal fame and prosperity in the course of a few years as a winter resort for the rich and famous. Its Museum of Fine Arts is well known in the States, and its Teddy Bear Museum is one of its unique peculiarities. There's a long line of boutiques and galleries along Fifth Avenue. You can also find many great places to shop only a few blocks away on Third Street and in the Avenue District. Beautiful family residences and luxurious hotels line the road that runs to the beach. At night, many elegant restaurants, nightclubs, theaters, and concert venues await their visitors. Naples lies between the glittering water of the bay and the subtropical splendor of the Everglades, so anyone who visits can discover both the sophisticated ambience and the natural resources it offers. Many fishermen come here to try their luck along the coastline, and fans of water sports have a lot of options to choose from as well. Those who wish to play golf can choose from about 40 high-quality courses that make Naples a real paradise for golfers. From the harbor, you can take a tour boat to Marco Island, the Barrier Islands, or Key West. There are also two wildlife parks close to Naples, where the animals live in the shadows of century-old cypress trees. Paradise Coast is lined by coconut palms, and you can find plenty of shells in the sand. The coast of Florida spoils its visitors with an amazing versatility of options. You can find glamour, luxury, and a noisy nightlife here, but also idyllic places to enjoy the sunset and the sound of the waves in peace and quiet, if that's what you prefer. Thanks to the humid subtropical climate and the warming effect of the Gulf Stream, evenings are always balmy and infused with the smell of flowers. Mm -hmm.